Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, The Mists of Antiquity, is a reflection and analysis of some of the central elements of the craft ritual. It was written by Brother W. J. Collett, PGM, and the copy I have is undated. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries an archive of Masonic lore. When we talk about the origins of Freemasonry, we frequently say that they are buried in the mists of antiquity. This means that the beginnings of the craft are not easily definable. For some students of Masonic history, the mists of antiquity lie in the history of Freemasonry previous to the origin of the four speculative lodges that operated in London and ultimately came together to form the Grand Lodge of England in 1717. This means a study of the great manuscripts that record the charges of Freemasonry such as the Halliwell Manuscript, also known as the Regius Poem, which dates from approximately 1380 AD, and the Cook Manuscript, which comes from about 1450. For others, it means an attempt to trace the origins of the craft back to the building of King Solomon's Temple at about 975 BC. This is because our ritual and the Hiramic legend are so closely connected with the events of the reign of King Solomon. It is doubtful that the moral teachings, or indeed any of our ritual, came from that period. Bailey and Kent, the authors of a standard textbook called The History of the Hebrew Commonwealth, make the startling comment that, if there was anything done in Solomon's reign to strengthen the people in material or intellectual ways, if there was any endeavour to purify religion or elevate morals, we do not know of it. No heroic or noble act is recorded of anyone while Solomon was on the throne. Of Solomon, the scholars say, The empire was his slave, and the sole end of its toil was his pleasure. No country can long stand such a strain. These words are true historically. After the reign of King Solomon, the empire that King David had built disintegrated, and the years that followed were filled with chaos. Masons, quite naturally, recoil from the verdict of such scholarship. The words strike at the very roots of some of the teachings that we hold dear. Did not the legend of Hiram Abiff come out of King Solomon's reign? Did not Solomon mourn for the loss of his architect and order that he be decently interred. Were not the villains in the legend given their just deserts? Of all these things, we have no real evidence in the Old Testament. It is true that in the first book of Kings, chapter 7, and in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 2, there are very brief references to Hiram. However, there are no real details. The legend that grew up around him dates from the early 1700s. The first real evidence that any lodge used a dramatised version of the Hiramic legend puts the date as late as 1722. Thus it is that in some of the Masonic traditions that are dearest to the hearts of Masons are buried in the mists of antiquity. From whence then came the moral and spiritual teachings of Freemasonry? From whence came many of the mystic rites that we now perform? In order to understand some of these difficult questions, we must first of all remind ourselves that Christianity and Freemasonry were from the earliest times closely bound together. Our forebears, the operative Masons, were the men who built the majestic cathedrals of Europe to honour Jesus of Nazareth, who was of humble origin and who most certainly would not feel at home in some of the beautiful edifices erected in his honour. 
Indeed, many of the intricate ceremonies conducted in those cathedrals would be completely foreign to him. Let us remember that his public ministry lasted but three short years, and all he left behind him were eleven followers who had to meet in secret because they feared the wrath of both the people and the governments. Later came an elaborate system called the Christian Church, complete with numerous ceremonies and mystic rites. With that development, Freemasonry was closely linked, in spite of the fact today we claim it to be a universal science with no special religious ties. The latter claim is quite true, for Freemasonry, as well as Christianity, attracted to itself many practices other than those of the Hebrew religion. There existed in both the Greek and Roman cultures certain practices known as the mystery religions. These were not confined to Greece and Rome. Evidence of them may be found in the early cultures of China, India, Egypt and other ancient civilizations. They were secret religious assemblies with special initiation rites and most certainly were present in the time of Jesus. Undoubtedly, they had an influence on the growth of the ceremonies of early Christianity. Some of the customs of the mystery religions became an integral part of Christian ritual. One only needs to examine some of the mysticism surrounding the festivals of Christmas and Easter to understand this. The mystery religions were very selective in their membership. No uninitiated person was permitted to take part in the ceremonies. Note the relationship here with Christian Holy Communion, and also with the practices of Freemasonry. The mystery religions appear to have had a double purpose. First, they wished to hand down, from generation to generation, the traditions associated with the gods in whom, whose honour they were organised. Secondly, they taught very carefully how certain rituals were to be performed, and then trained their initiates to carry out those rituals exactly. Under no circumstances were there to be variations from the ancient traditions, even in the words of the rituals. The prime purpose of the mystery religions was not to teach dogmatic religious beliefs. It was to strive for the moral improvement of their membership. The rituals were designed not only to improve the morals of the adherents, but also to implant in their membership a hope for the life that would go on after death. The first remarkable resemblance between the mysteries and Freemasonry is that membership rested on the voluntary choice of the individual. No one was ever invited to belong to a mystery religion. The individual had to volunteer to become a member. If the individual indicated his desire, and if he were accepted, then he had to submit himself to the initiation rites. These rites were designed to provide for the candidate an emotional experience that would tie him forever to his religion. When that was done, he was accepted into a fellowship designed to give him support as he became more and more absorbed into a community of regenerated individuals. The ultimate goal of the mystery religions was to establish a relationship between the individual and the gods. It was supposed to be an intimate and personal type of communication that would bring the individual the particular help he needed to live the type of life expected of him as a member of the religion. For the mysteries, the initiation rites sought to bring the individual, no matter what his age, a sense of being born again, and, as he grew in knowledge, to admit him to a sense of maturity that he did not possess before. After he was initiated, and as he was transformed from childhood to maturity, he was expected to share in the social duties of the religion. The social and moral issues that faced the particular nation became his responsibility. One of the most important aspects of the mystery religion was the program of instruction for the initiates. Each new member was required to take time to go through a course of instruction. 
he was taught how he should act in the ceremonies of the group and what he should do in his relationship with his fellow members and his community. He was encouraged to think in terms of the philosophy of the religion and the means of transferring the thought into action. There are many things about the mystery religions that are not known. The reason is that the religions had an inviolable rule that all initiation rites and instruction were transmitted by word of mouth. It was forbidden that anything be written. Thus the customs and traditions were handed on orally from individual to individual and from group to group. We have never been able to discover, for instance, what exactly happened in the ceremony of initiation. On the other hand, it is known that the total effect of a mystery religion was to weld a chain of continuity that lasted through the ages. The system disappeared with the growth of the Christian religion and the collapse of the Roman culture in the early years of this era. When Rome was overrun by the barbarians of Europe in the first century AD, the mystery religions, as such, disappeared, although remnants of their practice survived. The mystery religions were always connected with a god. The ancient peoples generally worshipped many gods, but from that variety of divinities, a mystery religion adopted one that it worshipped and to which it paid special loyalty. They customarily selected a god that had something to do with fertility and growth. Hence, some of them became associated with fertility rites, and out of that, some practices grew up that put some of the religions into disrepute. From such things arose an aura of suspicion over the secret meetings of the mysteries, and questions were raised constantly about what actually went on in the initiation rites. It is safe to assume that the majority of the mysteries sincerely sought to raise the moral life of their membership, and the abuses of secrecy were minor. Because, in general, ancient peoples were concerned about survival and the assuring of the regular succession of seasons, their great legends had to do with their great concerns. It came about, too, that the contents of the mystery religions were mainly communicated by means of legends. In the legends, the earth is usually thought of as the great goddess of fertility. This goddess grew old and feeble as the autumn season approached and was continually in danger of death. If the goddess of fertility died, that would mean that the primitive man would suffer from hunger and perhaps starvation. The idea of the goddess of fertility dying filled the early peoples with terror. Therefore, it was essential that a magical rite be performed that would assist the goddess of fertility to survive the dangerous period of winter. Through this magical rite, the goddess, in danger of dying and making the earth barren, would be brought to life again and once more possess a young and vigorous body. The result would be that fertility would be restored to the earth and people would be able to eat once more. Space will not permit to relate the fascinating legends that have been preserved out of the mists of antiquity, yet it is hoped that the Masonic reader recognises the similarities between the goddess of fertility myth and the legend of Hiram Abiff. Certainly, the legend of Hiram does not come from the Old Testament. The story in the Old Testament tells of Hiram, king of Tyre, sending another Hiram, the son of a widow, to help Solomon build a temple. If the story is read carefully, it can be seen that Hiram, the widow's son, was not so much the architect as he was a skilled worker in brass, stone and purple. Chronicles says that Hiram's mother was of the daughters of Dan, while his father was a man of Tyre. Beyond these scanty facts, the Old Testament tells us nothing. There is no record of the murder of Hiram, not even any indication that he died. It is evident that he had dropped out of the picture by the time the temple was dedicated. As stated at the beginning, 
We do not know where the legend of Hiram originated, but we do know that it did not become current until the 18th century. In this, the legend does not differ very much from the lack of knowledge as to the origin of much of our ritual. It is feasible to speculate that it was written by some scholar who had steeped himself in the legends of the mystery religions. Certainly, all the ingredients are there. The murder of a productive god, the disposal of the body by the powers of darkness, the discovery of the body by the powers of light, the raising of the body from darkness to light, and the return to productive living. In addition, there are the accompanying signs and symbols which are kept secret. There is also the dedicated journey of those who sought for the body and the ultimate discovery of it, the punishment of those who sought for the hero's death, and the honour bestowed upon the person who was raised. We are attempting in this paper to discover origins, but we must also note that the legend of Hiram has been carefully refined and adapted to the lessons that the science of Freemasonry teaches. To wit, 1. Hiram, in the Masonic legend, is not restored to life as are the gods of the mystery religions. The Christian religion follows the mystery religions to this conclusion. To have life restored in the Masonic ritual would introduce a strange and jarring note. The writer of the Hiramic legend appropriately ends it with having the remains properly interred. However, the signs and symbols remain. They are transferred to the candidate who is urged to remember the noble example of a man who would rather suffer death than betray a sacred trust that had been vested in him at his initiation and throughout the instruction that he received after, after his voluntary entry into the order. 2. The raising of Hiram in the legend symbolises the entrance of the human soul into a new and better stage of experience. It points out that it is the duty of all men to prepare themselves for a new life by following the glorious example of dedication and perfection. It should be noted that an element of resurrection remains. Although the bones are interred, the new life, the resurrected one, is transferred to the candidate. What more meaningful idea of the resurrection can there be than that the goodness of the person who has died lives on in those for whom he lived. 3. The Hiramic legend in Freemasonry does not have the magical elements that are common to the legends of the mystery religions. In one of the versions of the Osiris legend, Isis, a virgin, throws herself on the dead body of Osiris and immediately becomes pregnant, and later is the virgin mother of the god Horus. The reason for raising the body of Osiris was so that it might be interred in consecrated ground. Certain signs are learned by those who raise the body, but they are not the genuine secrets. Those have yet to be discovered. The quest does not end with the raising of the body. The search must go on, for the purpose is the unending search for eternal truth. It is only by constant struggle to attain the elusive truth that we can live the life triumphant. This version comes as close as we can get in the ancient legends to the teachings of the Hieronic legend, namely that the search for the missing word must go on into eternity. The Hieronic legend does not end in crass materialism as do most of the mysteries. The conclusions of the legends of the mysteries indicate that the ancient peoples because of their exploits, assure themselves of material gain, such as the return of food after winter barrenness. The lessons we learn in Freemasonry is that there is another way of living that is far higher than the material one. It is the world of brotherhood and service in this present life. After that, when this transient existence is ended, we may find a happier and more abundant life. Until the time of transition arrives, from the present to the eternal future, we must be faithful to our obligations and to our duties. 
we must learn to live at peace with the mysteries that constantly surround us. It is impossible to assert with any certainty exactly where the legend of Hiram Abiff originated, or to find any documented account of its direct relationship to the mystery religions of the ancient cultures. It is possible for us to say that the Hiramic legend and all the ancient legends form a part of humanity's great quest for the meaning of life and death. That originated with man as he became a conscious and thinking being, and will not end until man vanishes from the face of this earth, either because of his own foolishness or because of his disappearance in the process of evolution. The legend is part of the ongoing stream of human thought. To take a speculative journey through the mystery religions for this author enhances the legend of Hiram Abiff and greatly enriches its meaning. No longer is Hiram only a man of honour who is willing to sacrifice his life rather than betray a sacred trust. He stood for something far greater. He became a part of humanity, reaching out to an unknown power seeking for some assurance of permanency and love. Man has frequently fallen into the error of thinking that if he could make corn grow, if he could amass corn so that he had to pull down the small granaries and build larger ones, he would have attained something that could not be destroyed, namely wealth and power. The legends, especially the Hiramic one, say something more. They say there is more to life than material wealth and strength. A long succession of prophets, priests and kings, including Hiram Abiff, have been sacrificed on the altar of crass materialism. Even in death, these men have not been silenced, but have lived on in the lives of those who seek the truth embedded within the legends. There is a life beyond, and that is the life of the spirit. It is the life of the spirit that holds the true secrets, and they rest only in the thoughts of the master mason of all mankind. Hiram was not the first builder to be slain, nor was he the last. Today, the eternal temple will not be built by men who seek for advantages of their own, but it will be built with devotion, sacrifice, death and resurrection.